World News Tonight. Disqualified. In a surprising turn of events, Colorado Supreme Court kicks off Donald Trump from state's 2024 ballot. Suspended. India suspends 141 lawmakers as ruling BJP is accused of stifling opposition. Rescue underway. China grapples with the surmounting repercussions of the deadliest earthquake in decades. Napping cats. Thai farmer turns rice paddies into whimsical cat art with rainbow rice. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Sanuvi Mudanayaka. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News. We begin tonight with the road to the White House, where we bring you the latest US election update. Donald Trump's 2024 US presidential campaign run has faced a major setback after the Colorado Supreme Court disqualified Trump from appealing on state ballots because he was indicted for the 2021 U.S. Capitol riots. The decision attracted divided opinions. A slew of GOP lawmakers slammed the Colorado Supreme Court's decision to kick former president off the ballot, with some claiming it's an attempt by Democrats to prevent Trump from winning the 2024 election. House Speaker Mike Johnson railed against the decision, calling it nothing but a thinly veiled partisan attack. Meanwhile, Democratic lawmakers voiced their support for the ruling from Colorado's Supreme Court. The Vice President Kamala Harris on one of the first big Biden-Harris campaign pushes of 2024 too offered harsh words for former President Donald Trump. Donald Trump has been disqualified from serving as U.S. President and kicked out of the presidential primary election in Colorado next year. The state's highest court made the historic decision on Tuesday over the former president's role in instigating violence against the government in the Capitol attack by his supporters on January 6, 2021. The 4-3 ruling by the Colorado Supreme Court was based on a rarely used provision of the U.S. Constitution. Section 3 of the 14th Amendment bars officials who have engaged in insurrection from holding office. Trump is now the first presidential candidate in history to be disqualified from the White House under that rule. The majority justices acknowledged the judgment was uncharted territory, but said, quote, we do not reach these conclusions lightly. Trump's campaign said they will appeal the ruling at the U.S. Supreme Court, calling it flawed and undemocratic, while Trump accused the Democrats of election interference at a campaign rally in Iowa. Crooked Joe Biden and the far-left lunatics are desperate to stop us by any means necessary. They are willing to violate the U.S. constitutions at levels never seen before in order to win this election. The case was not brought forward by Biden, but a group of Colorado voters backed by a nonprofit called Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington. In a statement, the nonprofit said the court's decision is, quote, not only historic and justified, but is necessary to protect the future of democracy in our country. The lawsuit is seen as a test case for a wider effort to strike Trump off state ballots under the 14th Amendment. Tuesday's ruling overturns a lower court's judgment in Colorado that concluded Trump did engage in insurrection, but that, as president, Trump was not an officer of the United States who could be disqualified under the provision. It now sets the stage for the U.S. Supreme Court to potentially consider whether he's eligible across all 50 states to serve as president again. Half of the judges that make up the top court's conservative majority are Trump appointees. Next in India, the parliament has witnessed heated protests after 49 more opposition MPs were suspended, talking the total number of barred lawmakers to 141. The MPs were protesting against last week's security breach in parliament. Opposition lawmakers are accusing India's government of an attack on democracy after dozens of them were suspended from parliament this week. The latest twist in a historic dispute between the ruling Bharatiya Janata Party and a newly formed alliance that is seeking to unseat them next year. House speakers have suspended a total of 141 opposition lawmakers, 95 from the lower house and 46 from the upper chamber, according to a tally in what one rights group said was a record. 
Prime Minister Narendra Modi's BJP has a majority in both houses and is now expected to legislate almost unopposed for the remainder of the session that ends Friday. The suspensions come as Parliament is set to debate a controversial criminal reform bill which Mallikarjun Kharge, chief of main opposition Congress party, has said could unleash draconian powers and impede citizens' rights. The suspensions were enacted following a major security breach in Parliament last week when two men stormed the chamber, chanting slogans and releasing coloured gas. The opposition lawmakers demanded a parliamentary debate on the breach, only to be suspended by their respective House speakers for causing disorder. Shashi Tharoor, a suspended Congress lawmaker, wrote on X, quote, For the first time in my parliamentary career of nearly 15 years, I too entered the well of the House holding a placard calling for a discussion on the recent security breach. I did so out of solidarity with my colleagues who have been unjustly suspended for demanding accountability from the government. End quote. Jayaram Ramesh, another suspended Congress lawmaker, described the suspensions as a complete purge. The removal of opposition lawmakers occurred so that draconian bills are passed without meaningful debate, he claimed on X. Describing the suspensions as a record number, the New York-based Human Rights Foundation said it strongly condemns India's ongoing crackdown on the opposition and critics, in a statement posted on X. Most of the suspended MPs are part of an alliance known as India, a coalition of opposition parties that is looking to defeat Modi and the BJP in the next year's general election expected in May. The BJP has been repeatedly accused by its critics of stifling opposition and undermining democracy in Parliament. It has repeatedly denied the allegations. Moving on to the disaster stricken China next. Surrounded by destruction, survivors of an earthquake mourned the dead and endured a frigid cold in temporary shelters today, unsure how to rebuild their lives in the remote mountains of northwest China. The powerful tremors set off a scramble in northwestern China. People running from homes and buildings into the frigid night. At the earthquake's epicenter, an all-out search for survivors. Videos and photos shared by Chinese state media showing people pulled from the rubble and scores are injured. Local officials say nearly 5,000 buildings were destroyed. Freezing temperatures at high altitude, making rescue operations more of a challenge. China's earthquake agency said the trembler measured magnitude 6.2 at a depth of just six miles, centered in Jushishan, a remote and impoverished county along the Tibetan Plateau, an area where earthquakes are not uncommon, but this is the deadliest in nearly a decade. More than 300 aftershocks have followed, according to state media, Thousands now huddling in temporary shelters and bitter conditions. Major flooding in northern Australia has begun to ease, but many towns remain isolated in crocodile-infested waters as supplies dwindle. Extreme weather driven by ex-tropical cyclone Jasper has dumped a year's worth of rain on parts of Queen's Island. With barely any possessions except for the clothes on their backs, men and women clutching children race towards their only lifeline. Filing one by one onto the waiting ADF helicopter after days stranded in Woodrow Woodrow. They were flown to nearby Cooktown where finally they're out of harm's way. These just some of the hundreds of evacuees from the remote Queensland community rescued from roofs and flood-ravaged properties in a major military operation. That really is the miracle of this event, an event so big and as far as we know at this stage, no loss of life. Flood marks on the ceiling revealing the extent of this emergency. Homes here swallowed by flood waters. Lucky we got out of here. This is the home of the town's deputy mayor, Regan Kulka. It's covered in a thick layer of brown sludge. Look at all the bloody mud here. 
All remaining residents who want to leave are expected to be safely evacuated tonight, but an elderly local is still missing. Very concerned for his wellbeing, uh, especially now that they've been able to access his property and can't find him. 35 communities in the state's far north remain cut off. The key issues we still face in some of the remote communities is resupply of food, groceries, medicine, water. The only way to send essentials north of Cairns is by boat. And this is why the normally picture-perfect 70-kilometre stretch of the Captain Cook Highway is littered with landslides. Look at this. A mountain, a mountain of rock here. It could be weeks before the roads repaired, leaving holiday hotspot Port Douglas isolated and quickly running out of supplies. Supermarket shelves here are stripped bare. Bread, meat and vegetables are scarce. Similar scenes further north in Mossman, where the clean-up continues. Kevin Creeks lived in his Mossman Street home for 40 years. It was inundated earlier in the week. Most of his family's possessions have been destroyed. Russian President Vladimir Putin said Moscow will continue with what it calls a special military operation in Ukraine next year. But at the same time, Putin expressed his willingness to hold peace talks as long as they are in Russia's national interest. Meanwhile, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky said he is confident of support from Western countries. Russian President Vladimir Putin spoke at a defense leadership meeting in Moscow on Tuesday, during which he stressed that Russia will not give up what he called its territory, adding that Moscow will not abandon the goals of its special military operation. The West is not abandoning its strategy of containing Russia and its aggressive goals in Ukraine. Well, we are not going to give up our goals for a special military operation. He said Russia had taken on 490,000 contract and voluntary soldiers in 2023, adding that next year Russia will try to boost those forces to 745,000 men. During his meeting with the defense ministry, Putin said if Western countries or Ukraine want to hold talks with Russia, he's ready to do so, but it would be on Russia's terms. History will put everything in its place. We won't interfere, but we won't give up our territory. This is what everyone in Ukraine, Europe and the USA, everyone who is aggressive towards Russia should understand. If they want to negotiate, let them negotiate. We will only do it based on our interests. Putin also reiterated that Ukraine's accession to NATO, even if it's 10 or 15 years from now, is unacceptable. Meanwhile, at an end-of-year news conference on Tuesday, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said that he was confident his country would continue to receive important financial support from the U.S. and the EU. As for financial assistance, we are working very hard on it. I am sure that the United States of America will not betray us and that what we have achieved with the United States will be fulfilled. He added that no one knows when the war in Ukraine will end, but the moment could be brought closer if everything necessary for victory is done. Russia annexed Crimea in 2014 and in 2022 claimed the four additional regions of Ukraine that its troops partially control are part of Russia. Kiev says it will not rest until every last Russian soldier is ejected from Ukraine. We'll be back with more world news after this short commercial break. Welcome back. Moving on to Israel Hamas updates. As Israel continues its assault on Gaza, there is growing concern over humanitarian conditions in the besieged enclave. Al Nasser Hospital in Khan Yunis is the largest remaining fully functional hospital in the Gaza Strip. In the last few days, it has been shelled twice by Israeli forces, drawing condemnation from the UN Children's Fund on Tuesday. I'm furious. I'm furious that those with power shrug as the humanitarian nightmares un unleashed on a million children. I'm furious that children who are recovering from amputations in hospitals are then killed in those hospitals. I'm furious that there are more children hiding as we speak somewhere um, who will no doubt be hit and have amputations in the coming days. He said that the dire humanitarian situation in Gaza and lack of health services mean that malnutrition is soaring among Gazan children and diarrheal diseases are now deadly. He added that the number of child deaths due to disease may start to surpass that of children killed in bombardments. At least 25 people were killed, many of them children, 
when Israeli airstrikes on Rafah struck homes where displaced people were sheltering overnight into Tuesday. A grandmother brought her dead grandson to the Kuwaiti hospital so his father could say goodbye. When we woke up, we found the whole house had collapsed over us. The civil defense pulled us out and brought us here. That's all I know. And I don't know anything else except that two of my grandchildren were killed, Ahmed and Princess Aisha, who was just two weeks old, a little bird. And this is Ahmed, two years old. We were sleeping. What else would we be doing? What do people do at 2.30 a.m.? We were sleeping. The air and ground war in the Gaza Strip has killed nearly 20,000 Palestinians, according to the Hamas Health Ministry. 1.9 million people have been displaced, nearly 85 percent of the population. A spokesperson for the World Health Organization warned Tuesday that hospitals in Gaza have become scenes of indescribable horror, their floors crowded with bodies and blood. International condemnation for North Korea over its missile provocations continues, this time from G7 members in their strongest terms yet. And over in New York, a UN Security Council meeting is underway to address Pyongyang's evolving military threats. G7 countries have condemned North Korea's latest launch of an intercontinental ballistic missile in, quote, the strongest terms. This is according to a joint statement released on Tuesday by foreign ministers of the G7 countries and the high representative of the European Union. The move came in response to Pyongyang's test firing of its most advanced ICBM missile on Monday, which has the potential to reach the U.S. It also urged the international community to take firm and unified action against North Korea's, quote, reckless nuclear and missile threats. The statement also criticized Pyongyang for arms transfers to Moscow and urged for a halt to such activities and for North Korea to abide by relevant UN Security Council resolutions. Meanwhile, U.S. State Department spokesperson Matthew Miller on Tuesday spoke of a shift in the country's North Korean policy while reaffirming full commitment to its two Asian allies. We have tried to make it a policy of never re, uh, not reacting to every provocative statement the, that he makes. And our commitments to the defense of the Republic of Korea and Japan remain ironclad. Miller, however, said the U.S. has no hostile intent towards the North and called on the regime to engage in dialogue. And over in New York, a U.N. Security Council meeting is currently taking place with ways to respond to Pyongyang's latest missile firing included on the agenda. South Korea, though not a current member of the council, is also taking part in the meeting as an interested party. However, achieving concrete outcomes such as passing a resolution is unlikely due to the veto power held by China and Russia, both permanent members of the council, as well as their ties to North Korea. Amazon billionaire Jeff Bezos has officially placed himself back in the space race following the successful launch of his new mission named Blue Origin after being grounded for more than a an year. And liftoff. Blue Origin headed back to space and getting back in the race. And loving that view back down on the clouds over West Texas. 15 months after this fiery failure, which left the company grounded amid an investigation, Jeff Bezos's space tourism vessel today marking mission success. No human on board the New Shepard 24, instead 33 payloads containing scientific research along with 38,000 postcards. Blue Origin's launch comes a month after Elon Musk's SpaceX rocket Starship exploded in the sky. It's a battle of the billionaires amid their race to produce the goods for NASA and put man back on the moon. Blast off for Bezos marks the ninth time his rocket has entered space. It's reusable. But when will people be back on board? Google has agreed to pay $700 million and to allow for greater competition in its Play App Store, according to the terms of an antitrust settlement with U.S. states and consumers disclosed in San Francisco Federal Court. People in the U.S. could be in line for a payout from Google over its App Store. The tech giant has agreed to pay $700 million to settle an antitrust case brought by states and consumers. Eligible users will get at least $2 each, and maybe more depending on how much they use the Play Store. 
Google was accused of overcharging consumers through unlawful restrictions on the distribution of apps on Android devices. It was also accused of imposing unnecessary fees on in-app transactions. The firm hasn't admitted any wrongdoing as part of the settlement. Utah and other states first announced the deal in September. But the terms were kept secret pending the outcome of a related suit brought by the maker of the Fortnite video game. A California jury last week ruled against Google in that case too. The company says it is now working to make it easier for consumers to use alternative methods for in-app purchases. As part of the settlement, it will also make it simpler for people to download apps directly from developers. Lawyers for the states said the agreement would bring meaningful relief for consumers. Welcome back. Kuwait's Emir Sheikh Mashar Al Ahmad Al Sabah sworn into power today. For more on that story and more, let's take on the world in a minute. Kuwait's new Emir Sheikh Mashar Al Ahmad Al Sabah who took over when his predecessor died on Saturday, was formally sworn in before Parliament today. The law, known as SB4, makes it a state crime to illegally enter or re-enter Texas from a foreign country and gives state and local law enforcement authorities the power to arrest and prosecute violators. New Zealand's new Prime Minister, Christopher Luxon, met with his Australian counterpart, Anthony Albanese, in Sydney today, where he said he would look into the benefits of joining a part of the AUKUS defence pipe. Waters in Democratic Republic of Congo's capital, Kinshasa, grew impatient outside polling stations as general election marred by allegations of misconduct failed to kick off at its scheduled time. British Finance Minister Jeremy Hunt said today that there was still further to go on tackling inflation after data showed it fell last month. That is all we have for you on World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we bring you updates from across the globe. If you miss any of today's programs, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. Tonight, we are leaving you in Northern Thailand as sleeping cats have emerged in the lice paddies in recent weeks and spread out over an area a little less than a hectare in size. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.